Um, okay, so welcome back to the final uh, session of the uh, Mars Society Conference. Um, we have uh, a number of great talks this morning. Um, uh, we have uh, Darlene Lim, who is a uh, astrobiologist, works at NASA Ames, um, and uh, actually uh, she took this photograph, which was me giving the uh, christening talk, the opening talk at the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station uh, in 2000. Um, so she was there, I was there, we were all younger. Um, but there was there. And um, anyway, we have her, we have um, Jeff Landis, who is uh, a NASA scientist, and. Um, I don't know how to describe him, an applied physicist. Um, been involved in a number of uh, uh, space missions and, and certainly uh, technology development efforts. Um, we also have um, uh, two rover teams. Uh, this time, instead of having someone talk about the rover contest, uh, which is great. We're going to have uh, two of the participating teams actually come up and show you their rovers and 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 duke it out. Um, and um, and then there's uh, well, I guess there's closing remarks for me, which I'll leave till the close. Um, so uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Darlene Lim, a person engaged in the search for life on Mars. All right, well, thanks so much for coming this morning, uh, on Sunday morning, and making time for this talk. I appreciate it. This conference means a lot to me. I put this picture up, um, not just to, just to demonstrate the passage of time, um, but uh, also because, you know, um, this has been going on for so long, and Bob's been so instrumental in so many people's lives, and I actually wanted to take this opportunity to thank him directly, um, in and amongst friends, for the, the inspiration that he gave me, because this year um, that you're seeing up there is the year 2000, and at that point, that's when the Flashline Station uh, came to be. It was a lot of drama. It's really fun to give. That's a totally different talk. Um, but this is baby Darlene. Um, and so I got to be part of the inaugural crew. And so I just want to say thanks for the inspiration, Bob, and for believing in me. And like he totally rocks. And uh, he has been instrumental in so many people's lives in wanting to make this voyage to Mars happen. Um, and it still sticks with me to this day. I've made actually uh, you know, a job out of it, which is, which is really fortunate. So thank you. Um, so with that, on that note, um, of course, we're all here because we want to see human beings uh, head to Mars. And uh, NASA has a vision. Whether you like it or not, there is a vision. It's called the Journey to Mars. And of course, there are, are other people, such as Elon Musk, that have a great vision as well for this interplanetary species. Um, so along the way, no matter which point in time that you look at this journey to Mars, whether it's at the beginning when you have you know, tests that are supposed to get us ready to kind of leave for college, and then when you, you know, the next point, which I, I kind of find as being analogous to being at college, where you can kind of go home sometimes, you know, but maybe get your parents to do your laundry, or maybe not. Um, but, and then there's the total voyage to Mars where you're on your own, you, uh, you don't get any more money from your parents. That's it, you're cut off. Um, no matter which point in time, engineering is really, um, of course, an important component of each and every phase of that journey, no matter whose journey you look at. So one of the things that I'm trying to do as a scientist, and I'm, I'm now at NASA Ames, is to infuse each point, um, in each point of, that, of that phasing with science. And I don't mean like the science of engineering, I mean actually the element of conducting science out in these extreme environments. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is the work in scientific analog um, and the development of human mission architectures for the exploration of the moon, deep space, and Mars, and primarily focus on Mars uh, given the topics that were, you know, have been discussed over the last few days. So the first thing I wanted to start you off with is a definition of an analog. So this is my definition, doesn't mean it's everybody's, but I tried to kind of simplify it. And so I think that an analog is a place on the Earth that allows us to approximate operational or physical conditions on other planetary bodies um, and also within deep space. So that's why originally we were up in the Arctic. That's because we were at Houghton Crater, which is an impact site. Of course, there are a lot of impact craters on Mars, 
And it was a sedimentary environment that was very interesting to us, and that's what drove us there. That was in a type of analog, lots of physical and operational approximations to being on Mars. Um, and really, there are two types of analogs traditionally, and then I'm going to talk to you about a third kind, which I've been involved with very heavily over the last decade, which is blending the two types that I'll talk about. So the first one is a scientific analog, and this is a place on the Earth, maybe it's, you know, kind of deep underground, uh, or maybe in a lake that has these weird formations called microbialites, or this, this is actually um, a, a low pH environment in the low Arctic of Canada, which is rich with gerasite, which is the type of mineral we do find on Mars as well. And so these are, you know, places, these types of science analogs are places on the Earth that we can use to explore life at, as an ex at the extremes so that we can use them as a means to understand the habitability potential of our solar system. So that's one type. Another type of analog um, that I've had the joy of being involved with is an operational analog. These are very focused on technical elements or engineering elements. Um, they study the operational concepts and related technologies for hu future human robotic um, exploration. And so we go into places um, like uh, the Florida Keys, which is, holy cow, getting decimated at this point in time. Um, and we will operate underwater with these things such as, uh, let me see, this thing is working. These are deep, deep worker submersibles, they're single person subs that we actually used as an operational analog to pressurized rovers. And we actually went out and conducted a bunch of different, different operational concepts to look at, you know, we actually weighted ourselves um, in a way that was um, analogous to being on the moon and then tried to understand if you could actually associate yourself with a pressurized ro rover and conduct certain science exploration um, elements. Um, and then, you know, the thing that I've been involved with, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about over the next few slides, is a blending of science um, and trying to infuse it into these operational analogs. And the reason why um, I'm doing that in particular is because any time that we go beyond um, the confines of, of low Earth orbit as we progress into deep space and onwards to Mars, there is going to be a new operational paradigm that we're going to have to deal with when it comes to human spaceflight. For those that are involved with human spaceflight, you know that, in fact, every moment is scripted, whether you're dealing with the people that are in space or those that are actually on Earth. There's a script that you have to follow. It's a very delicate balance of command and control. But as we move beyond, um, you know, where we are right now, there's going to be a communication latency, a time delay between sending a signal from the Earth to Mars or Mars to the Earth. We already contend with this in any of our robotic missions in, onto Mars and into deep space. But that's going to change the fundamental cadence of any of our mission operations. And the perspective that we've been working on um, as a team through different analog projects is the perspective of science and how that's going to get affected and the, the, the perspective of actually um, discovering and exploring a new system under these types of controls. So how do we actually enable these astronauts on the surface to do their job and also allow them to call a friend on Earth, the world's expert, and say, Gerasite, so that they can check themselves as they decide what, what to sample and what not to sample. So um, I'm actually going to skip forward on that and, and just tell you about specifically a project that is ongoing right now called Basalt. Um, Basalt is a project that is focused scientifically on basalt. We work in two different um, analogs. One is in Idaho at Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve, as well as on the Big Island of Hawaii. Basalt stands for Biologic Analog Science Associated with Lava Terrains. And here's the in funny joke, is that with all of these, most of these analogs, anyways, the ones that I tend to be involved with, we pick the name and then we pick the words to, it, it actually makes no sense. It's like such bad grammar in so many different ways. Um, so going back a couple of slides, I showed you the kind of traditional two types of analogs, the science and then the operational analogs. And as I mentioned, what we do is we blend the two. So with this project, Basalt, and with other ones such as the Pavilion Lake Research Project, which some of you must, might have heard about, or Subsea, which is forthcoming, uh, we have three different elements, science, science operations, and technology that we kind of, um, we, we work on as a collective. So when I build these types of teams, um, I do so very carefully in that I try and bring together people that are willing to leave their perspectives as a, in a traditional sense, their ego, their obfuscations at the door and come to these nice round tables, metaphorical round tables, and decide that they're going to try and solve problems as a team. They're going to bring their experience in, but they're not going to bring all their biases in. And we have to do this because essentially 
we do real science, so I'll tell you about this in a second. Uh, the slides will move forward, actually. Um, we do science that's focused on figuring out, for example, in these volcanic terrains, what type of microbial communities inhabit volcanic substrates and how do the alteration, how do the changes that happen to this rock affect habitability and so forth. And um, as I mentioned, we work in two um, kind of complementary regions. The uh, region in Idaho is meant to represent present day Mars, as you will, and then Hawaii is meant to represent early Mars. And so there's a lot of um, different science questions. We've got this elaborate science traceability matrix. So we're doing that real science, but the thing is we do it with a twist. We actually do it in a way that involves um, a simulation. So we will actually absorb Mars mission concepts and then only allow two people to go out and conduct the science for this bevy of like 50 other scientists who are, you know, who include graduate students, senior researchers and so forth, people that actually have to publish in peer review publications. So um, it's totally cliche, but failure is not an option for our science program. Um, but yet, we tie the scientists, you know, the, the hands of the scientists and we say, hey, guess what, you can't go out there and actually collect your samples. You have to stay at home and you have to trust that these people who are not the world's experts in your field will do the work for you. And that is extremely analogous. It's called a high fidelity analog to a future Mars, Mars mission. Um, so just to give you a sense of the setup, so this is a, I'll show you two different slides here. This is a static two-dimensional slide, of course. This is in Idaho, um, and this is our field site here in the volcanic uh, terrain. You can see all this black stuff, there's all this neat lava flow. And then there's a little tiny community called Arco, um, which is about 50 kilometers away. And um, what we do is we separate our team out. So we've actually got a mission command center, and there we have our science team. We actually have a m part of the Mars crew which sits there, and that's simply as a byproduct of the fact that technically it's easier to manage them if we can get close to them. Um, and then we've got some other technical support crew that sit there as well. And then in the field, um, in uh, this area here, 50 kilometers away, is where our astronauts, if you will, in these little scare quotes, are walking around and conducting the real science for us. And so what you can't see as part of all this is, um, first of all, the fact that tons of work goes into planning these missions. We have to make sure that every single time that our astronauts go out into the field for us to collect their samples, they're called EVAs, extravehicular activities, that we have timelined their day so that they have the latitude to explore. We can't script them as we will, as we currently do with people on the International Space Station. And one of the major reasons we can't script them is two reasons. We need them to do the science. We need them to do, have the latitude to explore this area, whether it's Hawaii or Idaho, because we actually don't know much about these two areas. And we also are dealing with this, in that between um, the intravehicular crew, who's also supposed to be on Mars, and those on the surface of Mars or out in the field, there's no delay. They can have a conversation like you talk with somebody on FaceTime. But between the mission support center and the field, we put a delay in, a delay which is analogous to what you experience when we have missions go out to Mars. So in some cases, it's five minutes one way, sometimes it's 15 minutes one way, so 10 minutes round trip, 30 minutes round trip at best, okay? Because you need to have people, you gotta be able to think. If I say, hi, how are you? Well, you know, you wanna tell me I'm doing okay, actually, you know, I didn't sleep well, but you gotta kinda think about it, so there's an additional few seconds that get added in, which has a huge impact when you're dealing with things such as the fact that you have limited life support. So um, here's a quick kind of set of videos which show you uh, the separation and, and tasking. So these are people, uh, this is in Hawaii, that are sitting back at the Kilauea military camp, in this case about 20 kilometers away from our field site. So this is a composite, this is actually Idaho, because we can't fly drones unfortunately in Hawaii, um, so I couldn't show you the, the same thing. But anyways, this is our, our analog um, science crew, our astronaut crew working out in the field, and this is the IV workstation that's essentially their flight control station, you know, on Mars. So these guys have to do what we've discovered over the course of a number of different analogs, the heavy lifting. These guys are the most taxed, tasked, and ta uh, I guess, uh, taxed, what's the right word I'm looking for? Tasked, there you go, um, of all of the people that are here. These people have other friends that they can, you know, bring into a decision-making process. These ones are super, super focused on what they have to do at hand. But this group of people on Mars that are sitting, you would think, you know, happily ensconced in the, 
in the in in a in a pressurized hab, for example, and have their donuts and cookies and whatnot, they have to deal with what's happening in this time zone here on Mars as well as whatever's coming back to them from from Earth, and then kind of aggregate, synthesize that information, and pass it both ways back and forth. So it's it's a lot of work. So within that that framework of conducting our science. Um, we, as I mentioned, we tackle scientific questions. We also look at science operations and concepts of, op of um, uh, operational concepts as well as technical elements and try and drive forward on what we think are some requirements for human missions, um, especially in promotion of science. So um, this is a slide which has way too many words, which means I've been at NASA way too long. Um, but anyways, we ask ourselves questions within the science operations realm, such as which concepts of operations and, and operational concepts that include things like design elements, um, you know, flow of hardware, of data, of personnel, et cetera, and what type of capabilities, so hardware and software functionalities, enable and enhance scientific return. So we have that, as we do for our science, as our guiding question. And then what we do is we go ahead and we start to um, essentially test those different components within the framework of the mission that we have set out for ourselves. So we make some assumptions. We've taken um, kind of the baseline of, for example, the uh, human exploration of Mars uh, design reference mission 5.0, and we take some of the assumptions that are inlaid in that technical document and we bring them into our lives. So that's why we don't have six or ten people walking on the surface. We only have two. At this point, we can al also play with four. And then we separate our crew out into the EV crew, the IV crew, and the mission support center. So this takes a lot of work. I'm showing you the kind of dis, you know, distillation of months and months of organization and, and trying to put things together. And then what we do is we enact these different quantitative and qualitative systems that allow us to gauge the value, the enabling value of different hardware, software, um, protocols, you know, flight rules, all those types of things as they support science within these different um, operational paradigms, so these technical paradigms. So some of the things that we do to enable this process is um, we've actually had to build these EVA backpacks, um, and there's actually a paper that's going to come out in the journal Astrobiology early next year that talks about the different capabilities within these, hard, these um, hardware systems. And this is our main mode of communication. It's like a, a, a mobile um, kind of, you know, a repeater station, if you will. And all of the data that we transmit from the field back to the IV station or back to Earth is essentially going through and, and coming from what's getting aggregated within these backpacks. And so we send back to Earth our telemetry of our astronauts, so where are they? We send back scientific data, so we send back information about the minerals that they're investigating, so we get a sense of which samples they should and shouldn't pick up. We get um, human factors, so we start to know about their metabolic rates, um, about if they're kind of doing well. We also have these different metrics that we run on them in terms of their mood and so forth. And then they also have um, other data that they're sending back in the way of video and still imaging. So all that is in support of the science. And as I mentioned, we play in this circumstance with different um, operational elements, such as, in particular, the latency. So we, we enact a 5 and 15 minute one way condition. We have different bandwidths, so we'll actually dial up or dial down um, in, uh, in terms of the bandwidth that we get um, within the, the kind of two way communications between the field and Earth. Um, and all this is done within the framework of what some of the existing um, mission kind of concepts are for human missions to Mars. So. Um, I'm going to drive forward with, just in the service of time, with showing you one of the capabilities that we're trying to understand. So when you timeline, so for example, if I go out and I have my Apple calendar and I plan out my day, um, you know, I can kind of move through that. There's that little red bar that shows me where I'm at in my day and then you kind of walk through. That's pretty straightforward. So when we're timelining for the space station as well, there are a lot of things going on. You want to know uh, where you know, each person of the, uh, in that crew is at any given point in time, what they're doing, and so forth. But basically, you're in real time. So if I'm thinking about something and I need to um, you know, pass on my thoughts, I roughly know where they're going to be at any moment in time. Well, imagine now that you have humans that are on Mars. Um, and maybe you are a team maybe this big of scientists and you're not only in this room, you're spread out across the United States, maybe the world. And you have to somehow feed in your thoughts to the process of an EVA. 
So suddenly, you have to contend with what is happening in the present, try and send some information into what is effectively your future, knowing that on Mars, that's potentially already the past. Okay, this is like madness, like pure, absolute madness. And so this very ugly two-dimensional document you see here was kind of the first um, operational concept, I guess, for our timelining that we tried to enact to manage through the process of conducting science on our Mars, in Idaho or in Hawaii, under these delayed conditions, as well as under constraint bandwidth conditions. So I'm going to show you a little video, which hopefully will work. So the top line here, this is um, the crew on Mars. This is their, um, this is actually called Playbook. It's a capability that, capability that for timelining that's getting built out of Ames. They actually use this for different um, Mars exploration, exploration rover systems. They use this, use this on the ISS um, and, a, and a bunch of different NASA projects. But we're trying to kind of tweak it so that it can manage this crazy paradigm of future um, space flight to Mars. And so this is the crew. They see that they have this pre-sampling survey they're supposed to do, which is this green box here. And then after that, they've got this sampling location search that they're going to start doing. And this is the ground crew. So these people are on Earth. Um, and they, they have this block of time here to kind of think. And they've got to actually make a decision by this point in time to send it to, to Mars so that essentially they have a chance to affect what is their future. So oops. Oh, no, it's not going to work. Let's see if it's going to work. Could you guys press play back there on my computer? Is that possible? And if not, I'm going to have right on. Oh, is it working? Oh, desk down. Yeah, if you press like right down there. Oh, it's working. OK, so now there's like, ignore, ignore the other one. OK, so you see they're pressing. So this is meant to show you, oh, no. So Mars is actually running ahead. So they've said this is done. And now they're going to start progress on the next um, activity, so that slides and shoves together. But now Earth thinks that they're still able to think for another 12 minutes and three seconds about what kind of output they want to project to Mars to affect their sampling. But guess what? They don't actually know that Mars is ahead of schedule, and they won't know for a bit because we're like <coughs> running on delay. So what do you do? So then suddenly, guess what? If this is at the beginning of your EVA, even if it's at the middle or the end, suddenly this whole design is like, it's done. It's toast. It's absolute toast. So unless we can start right now and start to recognize these little devil in the detail things that pop up, and we won't be able to recognize this until, until we start doing it. So that's why we're doing it. Um, and that's why we've gotten funding to do it within the context of real science, because the science acts as a forcing function to make us realize what is truly necessary for us to do these EVAs that allow us to explore. And then in this circumstance, making decisions to affect the science is extremely important to the graduate student who's like sweating buckets because they don't get to go out there to collect their rocks to write their entire PhD on. So like anybody who's done any graduate work or undergrad or had a project where you needed to collect the data, think about it, where it's out of your hands and some doofus who's had like two months of training is supposed to do all your work. It's very, it's horrific. I sweat buckets too. Um, we have flight rules, crazy documents that go on and on and on and on. There is a reason. Uh, we do this because we've realized that within this paradigm of trying to have data, we're not even like talking about true command and control here. We're just trying to talk about some organized chaos, okay? And so within this organized chaos, we've recognized that you still need to kind of put some constraints on what a person can or can't do, how long they can run an EVA until they really shouldn't run one anymore. And so we have these documents that we're tweaking and that we're running through these capability assessment mat uh, matrices. So we take um, at the every other day, we'll actually get together as a team. Everybody, those who are the astronauts, IV crew, and the science team will get together and qualitatively and quantitatively assess all of the hardware components, the ops components, through the, a variety of different methods, uh, methodologies that, that get us to some, um, some sort of consensus as to whether or not something is enabling or not. Um, I think I've got a few slides, but I only have a few minutes left. But this is really kind of a thing that I wanted to show you all um, in terms of driving ahead to the future. I think you've had a lot of really neat talks over the last few days um, that touch on elements that we're starting to realize truly are requirements that will help us in the future. Things like um, virtual training as well as, it's not showing up very well, I apologize. Um, as well as the injection of virtual and augmented reality into our lives, into our EVA lives. 
We think that both back on the you know, in the ranch on Earth as well as um, on Mars, that if we can actually have a capability that will allow us to make decisions and then project that into the visual range of our astronauts, that will actually be tremendously helpful. As well as things such as 360 high resolution views like gigapans, for example, we're going to be testing that out in November, um, as well as um, other LIDAR management tools and so forth. I didn't have time to get into any of our technical elements, but I wanted to just tell you that in the new year we're going to have a special issue, the first of two, that will start to put out some of the operational findings from our project, from Basalt itself. And this November we're um, driving forward right now to our final deployment for this project in Hawaii, and that's where we're going to be bringing in other capabilities for, to enrich the science, such as drilling. We're working with Honeybee Robotics, which is down here in SoCal. Um, the JPL Ops Lab to bring in VR and AR capabilities, different 360 um, imaging systems, and so forth. And we're looking at things such as what happens when you have a gigapan image, which all the scientists want, that you have to send back, which is several you know, gigabytes worth, say, 12 gigs worth of data, for example. How do you actually, what kind of compression requirements do you need? How long will that download process take? When do you do it? Because you do not have limitless bandwidth um, available to you and how does that actually affect the decision making so we end up collecting the right samples for this, the graduate student who needs to progress in life and become you know, the Nobel Prize winner in microbial habitats on Mars. So um, that is actually my last slide and uh, you can check us out. We have a website and there are other projects that are forthcoming um, that are going to build and evolve this type of integrated operational and scientific analog system. Thank you. So obviously there's a whole lot of data coming out of um, these projects, um, all the analog projects that are, that are going on, mm -hmm. um, not only scientific data, but I think more importantly operational yeah. data. Is there a best practice guide not hidden in many, many papers? Yeah. So if, let's say, a group in Australia wants to start another analog, they don't have to start from scratch. They can build off of what happened at MDRS or High Seas or yeah. Basalt. Yeah kind of leapfrog the, uh, the construction of these analogs? Thank you for asking that question. So just to kind of paraphrase, one, um, the question is about how do you actually communicate all the learnings that we've been gathering over the past couple of decades, for example, of analog work? So I will tell you, this question that you're asking is a question that's getting asked at, at headquarters, at NASA headquarters. It is a huge problem. A lot of people will publish operational papers in Astra, um, Astronautica, I just probably pronounced that wrong. Um, but we have a ton of papers in there, but it is a journal that are, like, basically our buddies read, you know, and, <laughs> and um, we're trying to change that. So um, we happily have the Astro Astrobiology Journal, the editor is gonna take a chance on our project and actually publish science operations. Not s we have a couple science papers going into the special issue, but it's science ops. And so um, she's going to put that out at the beginning of January, and we're hoping that this sort of opens the, f the, you know, the floodgates, if you will, and then has other journals start to take this on so that the research community has a, has a place to go and that you start to know that you can count on these journals to find the, the data that's coming out. After this, um, Planetary and, spa and Space Science has also agreed to do a follow-up um, special issue on our project. So. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps, because otherwise I know it's astro a a Astronautica and uh, tech journals where you end up finding obscure data hidden. Uh, hi there. I was in an AIAA conference with a bunch of graybeards uh, <laughs> from the Apollo program who were talking about how we don't use checklists the same way that they did uh, to the same extent that they did in right. Apollo. And I was looking at your marvelous playbook tool and wondering if we could combine those two things so that we had a list of things that could be done, time constraints for them, and uh, then that would be an extremely powerful tool that we could use throughout, uh, you know, launch capabilities, uh, mission, uh, landing, EDL, you know, all the different uh, roles that we have in addition to supporting all of the wonderful science work. So seriously, rock on. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I, I probably could use like another 
an hour to bore you all or hopefully entertain in some way um, with the technical end of things. So Playbook is, um, includes a mission log as well as, um, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's another like subcomponent within Playbook where all of those procedures and checklists are integrated into it. And the thing I didn't tell you is that what we see, this Playbook interface, there's actually a, a wrist display interface, uh, which is the mobile version of Playbook, which includes their checklist, which inc and then as they start to check things off, that does affect that timelining capability and jigs with whether or not they're ahead of the game, behind the game, and then we've got a whole other set of protocols, like things turn, actually funny enough, red is really not a color that we're supposed to be using, there's a whole long story behind that, um, but it starts to flash or there's different colors that it changes that we're trying to decide on right now um, and uh, that tells you whether or not you're getting close to being ahead of behind if you're nearing like kind of a, you know, a drop dead date if you will or timeline. So yes, we're getting to that super integrated timelining tool that has those capabilities that you're talking about and getting it so that changes here will be affected seamlessly on Earth and vice versa, and then also give the IV station some sort of, cap like we're trying to figure out what should they be doing to manage through that entire timelining traffic as well. So yeah, I mean, the, absolutely, you totally like zoned in right away on what is important, and that whole integration element is super important. Thank you. Wrap it up, okay, I gotta wrap it up. Um, <laughs> I was probably not supposed to read that out loud, right? <laughs>